Dear colleagues, after a nice week in Paris, I'm happy to be here at the PCR TV booth. My name is Sebastian Even from Hamburg, Germany, and I'm here together with my colleagues Melvin Lobo from London, UK, and Faisal Sharif from Galway, Ireland. Today, we would like to discuss with you the interventions for hypertensions that we are talking about this year at the Congress. And my first question is to you, Faisal. We discussed a lot of about renal artery stenosis and how to treat patients with severe artery stenosis correctly. Would you mind to give us an overview about the current evidence? Thank you very much, Sebastian. It's great to be here. Uh, renal artery stenosis has a prevalence of about 20 percent. Uh, it is increasing and it is in people who have documented coronary artery disease. Renal artery stenosis has been associated with hypertension and chronic kidney disease. However, these associations are casual. Um, traditionally, we have focused on uh, treating uh, renal artery stenosis by correcting atherosclerotic renal artery disease. Um, in 1990s, we have some non-randomized small studies that showed some benefit of renal artery angioplasty, uh, and there was an improvement in patients who have hypertension. However, subsequent trials, uh, which were randomized, um, in again, late 1990s and early 2000s showed that there was no benefit in patients who were treated with revascularization versus patients who were not treated and treated with optimal medical management. And I think subsequently in 2009, we have a large trial, astral trial from the UK investigators. The investigators in this trial enrolled 809 patients who have atherosclerosis, renal artery stenosis, and they were divided into two groups. The first group was treated with revascularization, either with stenting or angioplasty with medical treatment. And this was compared with patients who were just treated with optimal medical treatment. It was a long follow-up of five years, and after five years, the investigators reported that there was no clinical benefit in treating patients uh, with uh, revascularization in terms of primary endpoint and secondary endpoint. The primary endpoint was uh, renal function, and the secondary endpoint was uh, systolic blood pressure, uh, renal and cardiovascular, all-cause mortality. So in fact, there was no benefit. Uh, indeed, in the patients who were treated with uh, revascularization have a higher number of adverse events uh, and there were some mortality in that group as well. So following this trial, uh, we had another trial, another big trial which was published in 2014, the CORAL trial from the US investigators that again looked at outcomes um, for patients who were undergoing renal artery uh, stenting. Uh, again, there were 947 patients divided into two groups and largely divided in, in the first group where there was uh, stenting and the second group there was just medical management. And again, uh, the trial was negative and there was no evidence that uh, there was any benefit in mortality, uh, all-cause mortality, renal, all cardiovascular, stroke, myocardial infarction in the patients who were treated with uh, renal artery stenting. So based on the current evidence, uh, I think it is difficult to justify widespread use of renal artery stenting uh, in, in patients outside the setting of a clinical trial. But Father, you're an interventional cardiologist and when you think on your daily practice, you might have some patient in mind where you think that they might benefit from a revascularization procedure. On which patients are you thinking? So this is an excellent question. So, I mean, there is a disparity between what we see in clinical trials and what we do in clinical practice. Um, I think you, and it's also important to remember that large trials that are negative in their outcomes uh, may disguise some of the benefits that a subpopulation may drive. So, I think in this instance, um, we have a consensus that patients who are admitted with significant renal artery stenosis and cardiac abnormalities, especially flash pulmonary edema, uh, patients who will have um, um, bilateral renal artery stenosis, which is significant or subtotally occluded. Um, patients who have single renal uh, or signal kidney, single kidney, sorry, with a significant uh, renal artery stenosis. These patients are at risk of significant renal ischemia, and therefore these patients should be treated. Or patients who have uh, accelerated hypertension for no cause, 
uh, should be also investigated and possibly given the option of treating. So there's a subset of uh, individuals or population of patients that should be considered for renal intervention and that again comes down to individualized uh, medicine. Thank you very much Faisal. Another important issue what we discussed at the Interventions for Hypertension track this year uh, was to create an AV fistula. Mel, may I ask you to explain us the pathophysiologic background of this procedure? Yes, it sounds uh, intriguing, doesn't it? An AV anastomosis to treat high blood pressure when we use them for renal hemo hemodialysis and in general try to avoid fistula creation in the uh, human body. But I think the idea behind this is to open up a channel between the artery and vein in the external iliac artery and vein circuit. And by doing so, we reduce um, systemic vascular resistance enormously and this seems to reduce blood pressure as well and I like to think of it as a mechanical solution to high blood pressure in which uh, we're moving away from concepts of attenuating sympathetic outflow which has been the case with renal denervation or bar reflex activation therapy and we're moving towards uh, thinking about hypertension from different pathophysiological aspects and it's very important to remember that High blood pressure is an issue predominantly in an older population where systolic blood pressure becomes the main determinant of outcome. And that population is the one that's prone to arterial stiffness. And we've not been discussing arterial stiffness in hypertension pathophysiology for some time now. So we're refocusing our attention and I'm glad that the coupler has given us this opportunity. May you published a big randomized trial, the ROX control hypertension study. Would you mind to give us an overview about this data? Yes, yeah, so the ROX control hypertension 2 study was a randomized controlled trial in which 83 patients were randomized on a one-to-one -one basis to treatment with the arteriovenous uh, coupler or medical management. In the study, we demonstrated uh, conclusively that the device was safe uh, with the six-month uh, primary endpoint and that there was substantial blood pressure lowering both for office and ambulatory parameters. And what was also very interesting is that in a subset of patients who had failed prior renal denervation, we also saw very large reductions in office and ambulatory blood pressure. And in some respects, the final effects in the study may have been somewhat muddied by the medication changes, which acted in favor of the medically treated group who were increasing their medications, whilst in the coupler treated group, there was a decrease in medications. And I think the overall message from the trial is not that we have a new treatment that we can take out to the clinic uh, for high blood pressure, but that we have a new way of approaching hypertension that merits further investigation in larger randomized clinical trials. And the uh, manufacturers of this uh, technology, Rox Medical, are going to be actually conducting a US IDE pivotal study starting any day now. So we'll be awaiting those results with great interest. We are really doing. Thank you very much, Phil. So, dear colleagues, I would like to wrap up this small session. We learned from Faisal that it's, the current evidence is difficult to, for a revascularization for patients with severe artery stenosis, but there are still at least some patients who benefit from the procedure. And Mel nicely showed us that we have for patients with resistant hypertension a new possibility to treat this patients with the AV fistula. So thank you very much, Mel. Thank, thank you. you very much, Faisal. And we are all, all three of us, we are looking forward to see you next year in Paris at the PCR 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian.